when I, when my team picked up your book and started exploring it together, we realized how valuable this would be, not just for us as professionals working with other professionals, but for them to also hear from you, your insights, the research, um, all of your experience with families, talking to families and with parents, especially. Um, so this book has been well-traveled and I'm just happy to have you here. And I think we should just dive right in. Let's do. Great. So uh, the first question, why this book? Why now? What's going on today that you felt the need to contribute to this book? <clears throat> well, for, for, first, let me say that I have enormous respect for people who could actually work uh, in early childhood. I started out my career in early childhood special education. And the one year I worked full time, I had a headache every Monday. And I just, I just couldn't, you know, I was, not, I was nice, but I just couldn't manage a group of kids. You know, so, so people, I just, I just take my hat off for people who, who are, are much better at it than I am. So we wrote this book for a couple of reasons. It was actually separate. And, and probably the most pressing for us was the incredible increase in, in stress-related mental health problems that you see it particularly in adolescents, but you also see it in children and even young children. The, the, the size of, of, of poor self, kids, kids these days, like five-year-olds, seem to have poor self-regulation than they did in the 1940s. There's a study in Russia that, that, that found that five-year-olds could stand still about as long as a three-year-old could, you know, 70 years ago. And so we're concerned about the stress-related problems, related to self-regulation, uh, just the fact that people sleep so much less than they used to. I, I see five-year-olds now, I, I test for a living as a neuropsychologist, I test kids and try to figure out what's wrong and what's right and how to help them. And so many five-year-olds that I see now sleep, they're, they're yawning most of the morning. And you witness changes along the way. Yeah, yeah, yes. I mean, I, I think that, that, that kids in general sleep much less than they did 20 or 30 years ago. And probably less than, they, certainly as they get older and they have their cell phones, they, they sleep less than they did 10 years ago. Wait, well, that's not a two-year-old, though. Hopefully a two-year-old right. two doesn't have a cell phone, but the older oh, Correct, correct. But, but, but technology keeps their parents up later. And I, so the, the tech, technology piece... Um, and I think that another piece of this is that I, I think that the most serious mistake in, edu in American education in the last 30 years has been to try to teach academic content to younger and younger children. And I think that there's just no developmental justification for it. I think it makes school much more stressful for people who teach, teach in preschool and, 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 uh, and beyond. Uh, and I, I wanted to address that. That's been a, a kind of a soapbox for me over the last 10, 20 years. And, and I wanted to address that as well. And the, the way that, that uh, my co-author Ned and I uh, conceptualize these issues is that one of the, the really important factors is a sense of control. Because we, we know that the most, the most stressful thing in the universe is a low sense of control. And we also know that, that for kids to be truly self-motivated, they have to have a sense of autonomy. And we started to study what this sense of control is and, 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 what it, and, it, it, and it's good for everything because the brain works well when you have a healthy sense of control. And, and, and whether you're two, whether you're five, or whether you're 55, mm. this, this healthy sense of control seems to be a really important okay. thing. So we'll have to explore that. And I know we're gonna talk about the brain science as yeah. well. And if you just wanna well, briefly show the first slide, there's just, it's just, that. it just summarizes the, the um, uh, yeah, the, the first slice is that the, the, the main thing is that the stress-related mental health problems reflect a low sense of control and healthy self-motivation depends on autonomy or sense of control. Yeah, and you know what, this might be a great time to ask the participants if they're seeing any of this. Okay, setting. let's so, do. You know, perhaps um, the questions out there now, feel free to chime in as we continue the conversation. Yael will monitor the uh, chat box for us. Okay. So um, because we have educators on, I mean, we've got a lot of topics we're going to talk about. A lot of it's going to include parents and the conversations with parents. But because we have educators in school settings, I really wanted to focus first on the school environment. Um, everybody has their vision of what a school environment should look like. But can you give us your big picture view of the best practices specifically for a school environment and particularly regarding the schedules of children? So 
I, what, what I, one of the things that I found extremely useful in clarifying my own thinking uh, about what kids need is self-determination theory. And this is self-determination theory is a motivational theory, and it, and it holds that to be self-motivated, you have to meet three needs. And one is, one's for a sense of relatedness or connectedness to people. And well, um, yeah, the, 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 so the, and one is a sense of, of competence, and one's a sense of autonomy. And I just find just holding in my head these three ideas that kids need, they, have, they need to be connected. We have, they need to have a relationship with their teachers, with their parents. They need to feel competence and they need to have a sense of autonomy. And I think that one of the ways of structuring uh, uh, schools should be, we think about how do we promote uh, these things that are so important for the development of, of, of motivation and stress tolerance. The second point is, um, is that, as I said earlier, is developmentally sensitive. I mean, when, when four-year-olds, even most six-year-olds, don't have mature enough connections between their brains and the small muscles in their fingers to manipulate a pencil properly. Mm -hmm. So when I see four-year-olds practicing writing, I know that they've developed these god-awful grips that are really hard to change. And we know, we've known for 50 years, at least, that the best time to teach a kid to read is age seven, not age five. So I think that, that the developmental sensitive is part. I think that... Um, that in terms of the structure of the day, that, that kids really thrive on familiar, a familiar routine, a consistent routine with some variation. But all the research, all the, the 40 years or so of research on the brain and learning suggests that kids need to, to, to learn. They need to experience a sense of relaxed alertness. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the ideal learning environment is high challenge, but low threat. And the low threat being low stress. And we want, we, want them, we want them to be challenged, but not overly stressed. And I think that the consistent routine, the, the, there's a slide out. We don't need to slow it, show it, though. But, but the things that make life stressful for everybody are new situations, unpredictable situations, things that feel threatening, and a low sense of control. And so I think that, that's, that environments that are, are structured, yeah, so this, it, you can summarize these things with the acronym NUTS, because stress that's makes you nuts. Yeah. That's the idea. And I think this is, this is another really useful thing is to keep in your mind this nuts, this, this nuts acronym, the things that make life stressful, because then we can work backwards. And some kids, I mean, some kids are more stressed by novelty and predictability than others. But I think that, that in terms of classroom structure, that I think that, that this, is, this is really important. And I will also say that in terms of the, the structuring the day, I mean, it's, it really is, I, I think for learning and development, it should be a, a, a balance between stimulation and rest, activity and downtime. And I think that um, that kids still need, when, when I was in kindergarten, you know, 60 some years ago, th th that we still, it was, even though it was only half day, we had, a, we had a little nap period and probably half the kids fell asleep you know, at, at 11 o'clock in the morning. And I think we underestimate the, the, that the importance of downtime. And there's a lot of pressure from parents who, who think that downtime is wasted time. But it turns out that, that really, if you're learning something, the chemicals, that, that the chemistry that happens to make that part of your brain happens during downtime. It happens when you sleep and also when you just go offline, when, when kids go to play. So it's, it's the balance between things where we're actually challenging them, stimulating them, giving them new things to do, and then having some of the downtime where, where, where their brain has, a lot, has time to process uh, that kind of stuff. Yeah, it sounds like it's a balance between what children can predict to give them a sense of safety and security, but also a novelty to excite them and encourage them to take new leaps forward. That, that, that's exactly right. And, and I'll... I'll I'll talk a little bit later, I'm sure, about the, the, the way we build resilience in kids mm -hmm. and the way we build self-regulation. It's, it's not that we never want kids to have anything that's stressful. I mean, because you don't, you, don't, you don't become resilient. You don't, you don't develop self-regulation. You develop self-regulation through, through mastery, through handling stressful situations, novel situations, even things that could be a little threatening, like, like being on a high monkey bar or something. That's the way you develop resilience and confidence. Okay. So... I have here in my notes too, that at one point I wanted to ask you about flow. 
Yeah. An interesting word. We have been talking about thriving, and I'm glad you brought up the word about children thriving. We also have been thinking a lot about our educational settings and how they contribute to the thriving and well-being of adults and children included. Yeah. And um, someone introduced me to this idea of flow, and at the same time, I remember reading something about it in your book to say that flow contributes to a sense of um, dopamine, a higher sense of dopamine. Yeah. So what I've, I've thought of it in terms of adults and like spin class, somebody introduced me to this idea yeah. where the yeah. runner's high. What does flow look like for a child? Okay. So the flow experience is one where you're completely engaged. You're completely engaged. And so it, it's not an experience where, where you're, it can't be too boring. You know, as an adult, if you play tennis with somebody who's 10 times better than you are, you know, it's really stressful. If you play somebody who, who's, who's no, nowhere as good as you, it's boring. You can't get into that flow state. You know, it has to be appropriately challenging. And the thing, the thing that I learned some years ago was that the thing that really develops motivation in children, how children become self-motivated as they get older, it's, it's not through dutifully doing homework in school. It's through this passionate pursuit of stuff they love because, because when they're, when they're, if a kid is for early childhood, when a kid is, is, is building something with blocks mm -hmm. or a kid's on a monkey bar and, and, and really has to co focus completely, completely in the, in the present to, to try to focus to, to get up to the next rung. Or a kid is in music and completely involved in it, completely not, not thinking about something else. What ha but what you're, what, it, it's something that's challenging where he has to remember the lyrics or he has to think about the lyrics and, and adjust the movements at the same time. You know, what, what, what you're, you're, develop, you're developing a brain state that combines high focus, high energy, mm -hmm. high determination, but low stress. Great. And that's the kind of brain state that we want. It just, you know, and it just makes sense to me that, that when kids are listening to a story, it's that complete engagement, mm -hmm. complete the present where I, for little kids, you know, they, they can be doing dramatic play and, 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 and often, and it may seem, uh, and it could seem like for, for an adult, you can be doing something for two hours and it, it seemed like a half hour passed. And kids have the same experience when they're completely engaged. So it sounds to me like if you can witness a child in that engagement, in that deep engagement, in a level of flow, those, that stress can't be there at the same time. Right, right. I mean, yeah. I mean, and right. If something, if something it doesn't is so exist. Right. Yeah. If, if it's way too hard, you know, it's going to be stressful for you. Yeah. It, it really is that 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 balance. It's, it's that something that requires appropriate balance between your skill level and the activity, and it has to be something you're interested in too. You know, that that if it doesn't doesn't it's something you don't care about. Right. So, you know, so when, when kids, as they get, they get a little bit older, you know, I, I want kids to be spending a lot of time doing things they love to do. And, 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 and as they get older, video games be, becomes a, a question that, that's not so much for, for yeah. two to five year olds. But that becomes one of the great challenges is because, because that produces flow. But I'm not sure it's, it's the same kind of flow that, that these other activities produce. Great. Thank you. Um, in your book, you have a framework for thinking about parenting. So we're moving away from the classroom now and your work with parents. And yeah. you have this way you describe or a framework for parenting where there's a spectrum. And on the spectrum, on one side, there's an autocratic approach. And on the other side, there's a permissive approach. And we could probably already get a sense of what those might be. But can you tell us in your own words what you mean by that? And also probably more importantly, where's the middle ground and what does that look like? Sure, sure. So, I mean, for, for at least 60 years now, uh, there's been research on parenting styles and they've looked at three kinds. The authoritarian, which, okay. is, which is my way or the highway, and you do it because I said so. And the, the other extreme, as you said, it, it's the laissez-faire. You know, they call it laissez-faire, the, the permissive, you know, that, that I got to do either... I, I'm too busy to be engaged with you, or I just want, I'll let you do whatever you want, because I, I don't want to set any limits. I don't want you to feel badly like that. And, and, and the, the, the middle is, is that what they call authoritative parenting. And the authoritative part is that you set limits, and you, you provide structure, and you don't let the kid run the family. However, you treat the kid respectfully, and you, you're supportive 
but not controlling. I, th I think that that's the thing where you're, you're supportive of your kid and you're not controlling. And in an authoritative parenting, you want, you want the kid's opinion. You want the kid to become independent. You want to support autonomy, kid's decision-making, and you treat a kid respectfully like, like his opinion matters about stuff. He doesn't always get to get his way, but his opinion matters. Um, so we emphasize self-direction. We value maturity over, over obedience in this kind of, of, of parenting uh, paradigm. And uh, a woman who helped us with some of the writing of the book uh, was just telling me that she had dinner with a woman who wrote a book about his, her experiences in nanny. And she said, the striking thing about, the, the, the writer said, the striking thing about this nanny, but she had a six-year-old with him and she was just so respectful. You know, she, she, she wasn't kind of coddling the kid or, or acting like the kid's needs are more important than hers. But she just, as time to go, the kid was working on a drawing. And she just said, honey, you need a few more minutes to finish that. I know that's important to you. And the kid just, you know, finished up pretty quickly. And then they went. But that, that, that's kind of what it is. And so it's, it's, it's an honoring of the work also. It is. It's, it's a really good point, Sheree. And I think, and, and you know, part, of what we, part of the point we make in our book is to think that we can make a kid do something is an illusion. You, 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 can't make a, you can't make a newborn eat. You can't make a kid, I mean, kid, all a kid has to do is flop on the floor if he has to do something. And then you can pick them up. If they're little enough, you can We've pick them up. We've all then, seen this. Then they aren't doing it. You know, you're doing it. And so if, if we just make peace with the fact that we can't, really can't make kids do things, then we find ourselves trying to force. Then we say something's wrong with this picture because I really can't force a kid to do it. So that's what the authoritative part is. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And when you were talking about supporting children in their work, this transcends over into the classroom because that's the role of the educator is to observe, watch for the passion, look for the flow, provide ample scaffolding. So what you're saying about the parenting style to me feels like it crosses over for anybody, like you said, the caregiver with the yeah. child. You know, when I was trained uh, in early childhood special education, I was tra uh, trained with a woman who had been a preschool teacher for 40 years. And she was at the end of her career. And she really had this, she really had a very authoritarian kind of approach to kids. You know, and, and it would be kind of, uh, kind of harsh with the kids at times. And, and, and I really, did, I, I, I learned what not to do. Mm. You know, and I, I think that... Um, that it, it's this we think about this self determination theory how important relatedness is and just maintaining that that, that that having a relationship I just met with a father of a sixteen year old last night who read my book and and just stopped trying to be so controlling of his kid and the I met with the kid too the kid said our relationship is ten times better just focusing on that that relationships are really important. Is that what you meant when you said relatedness? Yeah, relatedness, connectedness. You know, okay. and I think, I think that oftentimes, you know, we think that it's more important to, to, to do something for a kid. That, that as they get older, their, their homework's more important. We'll be on them constantly about it, even though, uh, even though it harms our relationship. And so the, 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 the title of the second chapter of my book is I love you too much to fight with you about your homework because they're, they're really, they're trying to make a kid do his homework doesn't help. But also that just keeping that in mind, how important that relationship is. Right. So I'd ask educators, what would they, how would they answer the sentence starter? I love you too much to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah good, good, good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Our next question. Um, Let's turn to the scary brain science. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I know you're not intimidated by it. I am. Um, so there's a continuing fascination that I know. I've actually been working on another project that has um, brain science as part of the research we've been doing. But there's this continuing fascination with the learning brain and the neuroscience is revealing a fresh perspective every day. That's what I'm getting. Many educators are not as familiar with what's happening. They know developmental milestones, of course, and they witness them, but they may not know um, exactly what's happening in the brain. And you mentioned some of this before, when kids are engaged in certain things. Um, so could you tell us some of those important developments that occur in children between the ages of two and five with regards to the newer science or the way you might describe the brain? Sure, sure. Um, most of the development, the most important development in the brain in early childhood is in, in the frontal cortex. 
yeah, the, the, the prefrontal cortex, which is, which is the most recent. And, and the, the brain science, uh, the most useful brain science is just not hard. And it's, it's just not, it, it doesn't need to be intimidating. It, so, um, so it's not it, hard. You're saying it's not hard. No, it's not hard. Because if you look at, if you look at this, this uh, diagram, I mean, it just it, the two most important things are the purple prefrontal cortex in the, in, the, in the very left, which is the most recently evolved part of the brain that does all the executive functions that, 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 that can put things in perspective, that can plan, that does organizing, that inhibits, that allows us to carry out goals. This, this is the part of the brain that is by far the slowest to mature. It's maturation in these brain circuits that, that are most important between three and six. And also in this slide, if you look down towards the lower left, see the amygdala. The, the, see, the, see it? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a little almond-shaped uh, oh, uh, structure. Small. It's right in the middle of your head, and it's a very primitive part of, of, of the brain that you can think about as a threat detector. The amygdala senses the emotional context of your experience and is particularly sensitive to anything that could be threatening. So, so if somebody's angry, if somebody's afraid, your amygdala senses and starts your own fight or flight response. And so what the most of the most of the and the amygdala is up and running from the time from infancy, from the time you're born. I and mean, the amygdala matures very quickly to keep to, to, to keep us safe. Because we need to, to, to know if something's dangerous, we need to know. Now, what happens between, between two and five is largely in this prefrontal cortex getting more mature and, and getting this better self-regulation, better control. Uh, I have a slide for the three core executive functions, Yael. Is that, it might be the one before it. Uh, yeah. Now, the, 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 if you know the term executive functioning, the executive functioning are the mental skills that are required to carry out goals. And so that, that, like, that we think about them planning, organizing, that kind of stuff. But the core executive functions, the one you see in infants, the two you see in the first year of life, are in inhibition, working memory, and cognitive flexibility. You, 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 you don't really assess planning ability in infant or their organizational skills, but you do see in the first year of life, you see this ability to inhibit. You see ability to hold more stuff in their working memory. And you see the, the increased flexibility. So I tried it this way. If that doesn't work, I'll try it another way. And so large part, it's these circuits that allow for this increased uh, developmental, um, increased executive functioning. That's where the most rapid uh, development is, right, right here, right behind your forehead. And you can see it by the time a kid is five, you can see it and they can do things like, um, they can hold two contradictory rules in their head, which requires working memory and hmm. flexibility. If you, if, if you have little chips, if it's red, put it here. If it's blue, don't put it here. They can do that. They can do things like, uh, they can inhibit doing something that they want to do. Your famous marshmallow experiment. Okay. You know, that, they, they, the ability to inhibit, they can, they can inhibit something that's a habit, it's habitual, or something they really want to do. Uh, and they can reserve themselves. They can hold themselves back from doing exactly, it. Exactly. And they can plan out by, by age five, they can start to plan out multiple steps. First, I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do this. And they can start to play games like Simon Says or red light, green light by age five, because that have, they have that ability to hold the rule in their working memory and to inhibit. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's useful to think about these three core executive functions. That you work with two-year-olds, you see dramatic development in, in these executive functions. By the time they're five, you see more development. And then you also see start the planning comes in and the organization and the self-monitoring, some of the more sophisticated executive functions start to come in. But that, that's- yeah, I think yeah. so Dr. Sixrod, at the beginning, you mentioned the high level of stress that some children are experiencing. How might that impede some of this brain development, or does it at all? Yeah, so th that's a perfect question, uh, because um, the most, in my opinion, the, the most important part of, of brain development, arguably, I mean, uh, other than getting enough stimulation to, to, to develop language and, and having a close connection with people, is... Is, is the development of the connections between this prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. Because, because five-year-olds who are not highly stressed and five-year-olds who, if something stressful happens, they get over it pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. They have stronger connections between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala than kids who are stressed easily. 
And that's what we want, is we want, these, we, we want to see this development of self-regulation in kids and emotional regulation. And th there's, um, there's th really, there are kids who are born with, their, their amygdala is just too sensitive. And so they're really easily stressed and they're, really, they're, they're, they're easily anxious. And it turns out, I'll just say parenthetically, that there's a very interesting body of research. You know the research on orchid children versus dandelion children? It's so fascinating because when, when people started to find out that these kids who were very easily stressed from infancy, it places them at risk for being, being having more anxiety disorders and more depression. But so it used to be looked at as just a risk factor. But then they followed these kids long enough. And what they learned is these really sensitive kids, they're not just sensitive to stress, they're sensitive to positive emotions as well. So that if, you, that if you raise them and you educate them in contexts where they're really sensitive and responsive, I mean, what, what infants need are warmth and responsiveness. And I don't know a time when we, that doesn't help you know, kids, but if they're raised like that, they actually turn out, these, sensitive, these really sensitive kids turn out better than other people, they're more successful. In, yeah. in a certain environment and with a certain support. Right, right. So they call them orchid kids because they need it. They, they need, the, you know, oh, a, a, I, I get the support environment. There's dandelion kids, you know, they don't, they don't, are, they aren't affected so much by the way people treat them. So it doesn't matter so much. Right. But, but, but the orchid part is really um, important, and it really the, the stress piece is, is related to this. The way kids become resilient. And I don't want, again, I don't want kids protected from all stress because the way you become resilient is you have, you have challenges that, that, are, that are, are challenging, they're tolerable, and you manage them. There's this really interesting research that we talk about in our book by Steve Meyer at the University of Colorado, where he took baby rats and he'd, he'd, shock, he'd shock their tail. And there'd be, there'd be a, a wheel in the tail, in, in, the, in the cage. And if they turned the wheel, the shock would stop. And so they, they, and what would happen in their brain is the prefrontal cortex would, would activate uh, big time as they're turning the wheel and it, and it would, damp, damp, it would, it would calm down the amygdala because they're doing something, they're coping. Right, right, right. Their sense of control. And what they found is that they did that a while, they disconnect the shocking apparatus uh, from the wheel. So the wheel didn't work anymore, but it didn't matter because these rats in, in any kind of stressful situation, they turned the wheel and they go into coping mode. And this is how we develop resilience. And this is why when, when parents want kids not, not to have, ever have anything challenging happen to them, it's not right because then, then they, they become too sensitive and they become too easily stressed. And so I'm sure, I'm sure our educators have met some of their students who exhibit some of those characteristics. And I, I would ask you to elaborate how might a teacher comfort set the right stage, uh, exhibit the right balance of support, but challenge in that situation specifically? How, how could they strengthen their ability to do that? Yeah. So, you know, I, I think that what we know with, with kids who are anxious is we, we want to be supportive, but we don't want to reassure them over and over again. I mean, that, that, so I think as we teach too, you know, we, we want to be compassionate. But the, the, the way, the, 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 probably one of the really good books for anxious preschool kids, it's called Be, Be Brave, or Being, Being Brave. Maybe. And the idea is you face your fears. And so I, I think our goal, as much as possible, is to help kids identify challenges, appropriate challenges, and help kids face them. And we, we can, one, one of the ways we can help by that is modeling ourselves. And we can say, and it just works so good when you say something like, you know, I was going to try this, I was going to try to, to fix this, uh, I have this broken toaster, and I was going to try to fix it, but I got really nervous, I thought I'd screw it up, but I'm just going to make myself do it, because what's the worst that could happen? Where as much as possible, we think out loud, we, we, we talk about our own experience and let kids hear the language we use to, to, um, to, to overcome our own fears. And so... Um, I think that when, when, when little kids are anxious, including kids who are you know, even four and five year olds, you know, I, I, I oftentimes want them, if, they're, if anxiety is a big problem, I want them to get help. I want them to see somebody who really knows how to treat anxiety in little kids because we don't want 
the, the anxious circuits circuitry to get to to uh, <laughs> the circuits to get to um, ingrained. And, and I think so it's, it's focusing on uh, the, one of the most important things that parents can do, in my opinion, is to spend one on one time with kids every week that you're the most important thing in the universe to me. I want to spend some time with you. I think teachers too, as much as possible, having an individual relationship with a kid. And it's much harder, obviously, if you got you know twelve or thirty kids. But as much, even even for just, uh, you know, two minutes, just taking a kid aside and building a relationship. It's it really is that relationship is one of the best ways to help kids learn to feel safe. And when you feel safe, you can take challenges. Right, and to foster their their sense of autonomy, it sounds like it's good practice for them to to hear you articulate your own ways of coping and getting through something or what stresses you, but to allow them to work it out as well. So it's, it's a sense of ballooning and comforting with them, but it's also observing them and providing them with the scaffolding so that they can work out their problems. Right. I mean, I, I, maybe, you know, talk it out with them perhaps. No. Yeah. 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 And I, because I, I think that, um, you know, if a kid, if a kid falls just and, and scrapes their knee and cries, is the message you want to convey poor baby mm -hmm. or you can handle it <laughs> you know and i think with with anxious parents you know, they, they, they tend to go a lot towards the poor baby and i i, I prefer you know, I, I know that hurts but you, you can handle it you know and i think the much as we can expressing confidence in kids ability to handle stuff even if it's hard i, I when i first learned that you, you folks know about the growth mindset Yes. Yeah. yeah. But I first learned about it, which is like 30 some years. You can, you can tell everybody what you know about it. So, so um, this woman, probably the, the world's major expert on motivation in children, Carol Dweck, um, years ago, 30 some years ago, studied kids who just, just like to do hard stuff. You, you like <laughs> give me a hard problem and I don't care if there's a solution. I'll just work hard. at. And if, if you give me a harder one, I'll work harder. Versus kids who they didn't want to look stupid, so they didn't want to take anything hard. They're very cautious, and she eventually concluded that the kids who love to do take on a hard challenge, they have what she called a growth mindset, which is the, the idea I, I get better at stuff for my own efforts. And the other kids, she had what called what she called a fixed mindset, which is th that uh, that I'm born with a certain amount of ability, and um, and kind of that's it. And and I think that um, that we know that it doesn't that we that from Dweck's work one of the most important things we can focus on is that is, is applauding kids for their effort what i used to do when my own kids were little is i just when they i'd see them working on something i'd, I'd say stuff like you know i just noticed this about you 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 you'd like to do hard stuff you get bored if stuff is too easy i just try to i, and I think that's a very powerful attributing yeah. qualities to kids like that um, but I, I think that that I the main message we want kids to have is is, is compassion. I, I know that hurts, and I also know you can handle it. Right, right. Let them let them feel like they can do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that there was when we were prepping for this. I remember us talking about getting the supporting the children and being able to understand their own emotions. Yes. Like to be really connected to what are they feeling in that moment, and that is one of the processes that they need to go through in order to get out on the other side and to cope. So we talk, we'll talk about the teacher presence later, but what is it, how can we help children understand what they're going through and be more aware of it? So one of our goals in promoting, um, in, in promoting self-regulation and the ability to, and, and stress tolerance. And I use the term in my, my own work, stress tolerance. I, I don't want people to never have any stress. I want them to be able to function well, even, even under stressful situations. And so what, one of the things we can do is just recognize that, that the, way, the way this happens is we help kids learn to tolerate stress or frustration for longer periods. Mm -hmm. And one of the things the teachers can do, if a kid's working on something, wants you to help, say, I've got to do something. I'm going to set the timer here for, for 30 seconds. I'll, I'll be within 30 seconds or, or, or a minute. You know, just letting, the, I, 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 you can handle it. You know, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be there. But just knowing, with anxious kids particularly, just knowing help will arrive and just make, make that time longer. Uh, that's one thing we do. There's no question, as you said, uh, Cherie, that helping kids identify and label their feelings is enormously effective in important helping kids to uh, to 
uh, discriminate or, or to evaluate or rate their feelings. But with little kids, you know, you can have a, 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 a red, you know, yellow and blue, and it, where the blue is feeling calm, the red's feeling really, really anxious or upset or mad. You know, and the yellow's where we're in a pretty good mood. And there, there's a lot of these things that have been worked out for young children. Um, yeah, we've, we've seen an explosion of like the mindfulness habits in the classroom or some techniques that teachers can employ. I really like the one that you suggested which was the the timer and to say i will be back and i can imagine this happening the following week and saying you did really well after two minutes let's put this to three minutes i know you can handle it but the, yeah yeah that really the, the way that that ability to regulate uh, stress and frustration it develops through controllable challenges in a supporting warm environment and that confidence that you can handle it and that not reason not, not uh, jumping in to, to, to rescue them mm -hmm. for, for longer and longer periods. Mm -hmm. and, Is there anything else that's happening in their bodies as far as stress that you can help us also see what they might sort of see through your eyes what they might be experiencing? Is it a rapid heart rate? What, what are some of the things we should be on the lookout for? Well, you know, what, what stress is, it, it's your amygdala senses threat, senses some kind of, or, or, or uh, feels some kind of threat, and will start your fight or flight response. Mm -hmm. And so when, when kids uh, get stressed, same thing. The first thing that happens is you get a rush of adrenaline. You know, the, the, and, and then if you're under stress longer, what happens is, you, is your, your body starts to secrete, your adrenal glands start to secrete cortisol. And adrenaline is very short acting. It's the first responder. Cortisol is, is, is something that's more, of, we're in this for the long haul. Mm -hmm. And the most dangerous thing about being stressed for a long time is having high levels of cortisol. Uh, and so but kids have the same thing. I mean, kids will differ according to cortisol levels from how stressed they are. But with kids, kids experience the same thing we do. You know, they, they, they'll have rapid heart rate. They, they, they feel fear. The, they can they can pant. So, 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 so some kids, you know, a lot of kids get when they're stressed, they get angry. Right. Oh, right. Yeah, the, 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 the shows up that that frustration shows up in anger. And and I think uh, we, we mentioned uh, in, the, in the book uh, this 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 model this way of modeling what's happening in the brain to young children that I think Daniel Siegel uh, came up with. You, you know this where, where you, you teach kids that this this is this is the part of the brain that does big feelings. This is actually the, the amygdala. The, the, it's in the middle of the brain, you know, and that does if you're really angry or you're really afraid um, or or you're worried about something that and the, this is the part of the brain. This, this is the prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain that basically can think that when you're, when you're calm, that this is the part of the brain that, that, that's running everything. And once you start to get frustrated, what happens is you flip your lid. You know, like, like that. And, and then th th this part of the brain is, runs wild, you know? And what we want to do is we want to you know, practice keeping this part of the brain, regulating this part of the brain. Um, and um, so, and I'll just also mention that uh, that there's a lot of things in early, just standard early childhood programs that have been demonstrated to develop these executive functions, these self-regulation functions, including dance, you know, mm -hmm. with little, little, little kids dance, just teaching them basic yoga postures, Te teaching uh, just some basic, you can start teaching martial arts to four and five-year-olds. Mm -hmm. And there's evidence that actually that starts to develop the, the, these self-regulatory circuits as well. Some of the Montessori exercises like walking on a line or holding a spoon in, in, with water in it and trying to balance it without spilling the water. Those kind of things where you're, you're, you're all these things, they combine, you have to, holding things in working memory. They, they require inhibition. Mm. They require flexibility because if you got that spoon, you got to keep adjusting it. So these things that exercise, what I was saying earlier, these three core executive functions really help to develop the, that self-regulatory ability, including the ability to regulate stress. Those are great strategies. Thank you. I'm sure everybody's writing them all down now. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that was about the children and their bodies and knowing it in their presence. Now we can get to the teacher's presence. How important is it for, or what should the teacher's presence be like in the classroom, in your mind? Yeah. So, um, 
the, in our book, we, we talk about, uh, there's a chapter called a non-anxious presence. And I, I wish I wish I made this term up, but I didn't. It was made up by, by Rabbi um, Edwin Friedman. And Friedman was a rabbi, but also a family therapist and a consultant. He consulted in all kinds of organizations, including corporations and churches and schools. And his thesis was that organizations, including families and schools, they function best when the people in charge are not highly anxious and emotionally reactive. Hmm. And, and so, you know, we, we introduced this idea of, of we encourage parents to think of themselves as an move in the direction of being a non-anxious presence at home so that home becomes a safe base. And we know that stress is contagious. Mm -hmm. That if, if, you, if, you, if a mother is holding an infant and the mother is giving something stressful to do, the cortisol levels, the stress hormone levels in the infant go up. If, if, a, if a six year old is, or five year old is sitting in a classroom with a teacher who's really stressed, that the, 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 the kids have higher cortisol levels than if they have a more relaxed teacher. Mm -hmm. And with the, the, there's all kinds of evidence that, that, that and also calm is contagious. Uh, Michael Meany, I, I didn't mention, Michael Meany is in classic re research in, in, um, in, in psychology that's relevant to, to this question because first study, he, he takes these, these, these infant rats from their mothers and he, he's, he basically, they, they separate them for 15 minutes and graduate students uh, just handle them in a stressful way and then give them back to their mother. And the mother is licking room and licking room and licking room. That's the way that, 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 that they re and restore at, at the, the, the rats, the rat pups. And, and the cortisol levels go from here to zero. And what happens is after that experience, it's kind of like those rats learning to control things. But after that experience of being stressed and being calmed, being soothed, these rats turned into, as adults, they call them California layback rats uh, <laughs> because they were so hard to stress because they had had an experience of being stressed and then recovering. So and, stress is not all bad if you're able to, to strengthen that part of resilience. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that, that, the, the scientists say we should think about three kinds of stress. Okay. One is positive stress, um, which is... Um, the positive stress is like the jitters you know, before you before before you're an athletic performer. Uh, first date. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that, that where actually you can do better. You know, if you, if you aren't too stressed, that, that the certain amount of stress actually enhances your performance. I mean, they call that positive stress. Tolerable stress is something like it could be something like like um, your parents get divorced. It, it can be something pretty stressful, but it doesn't go on forever, and, and you have you have a support. And the toxic stress is, is stress that's prolonged and without enough support. And, that's, and it's that toxic stress that really changes, in a not a good way, the architecture uh, of kids' brains. Um, and so we, we, it, it's not at all, we don't want kids to be in a stress-free environment. They don't develop that way. And, and life's not like that. But we, they develop by, by, by positive stress and having tolerable stresses in a supportive environment. And also, I mentioned this Meany also, Michael Meany also had a colony of, of, of anxious uh, rat mothers who did very little licking and grooming. And the, the, these calm rat mothers who did a lot of licking and grooming. And he fostered offspring from the low licking and grooming to the high licking and grooming. And they too became California layback rats, even though they're genetically programmed to, to, to be anxious. Oh, so that's very interesting. It, it is interesting. And, um, and it's just that, again, it's that warmth and responsiveness because when, when you have a connection, when you feel a connection with their parent or a trusted teacher, it increases the oxytocin, you know, the, the bonding hormone in the brain. And oxytocin mops up cortisol. Mm. Basically, uh, it, it, it kind of clears the brain. So we suggest that we think about home, ideally, is a safe base where, it, and ideally, school is this environment where of, of high challenge, low threat, where kids need to feel safe in school. But and it's with that when they feel safe, then we can challenge them. Then we can push them, and we don't want to push them. We don't want, we don't want to break them, but we want we, we want we want to stretch. Them. Yeah, and, but we, uh, we consult with educators now on 
creating, you know, environments, especially outdoor environments that give children an opportunity to test out and, and exhibit some risky play behaviors, but in an environment that's not threatening. So that, you know, the teachers play a specific role in looking around the play structure or the tree, making sure that there are no sharp objects, but allowing the child to test out some of their own limits. I think that's so important. And it's so interesting because it turns out that even all, all, in all our attempts to make kids' playgrounds safer for kids, that there's no fewer injuries in, than, than there used to be, you know? And kids, kids it's actually more. Yeah, kids want to be challenged. And, and so, uh, yes, the, the idea that somehow our job is to make sure that kids never have anything stressful, that they, they never fall down. I mean, it's, it's almost a cliche now, the blessings of the skin knee or the gift of failure, you know, that, and it, but it's hard for anxious parents. It's increasingly hard and parents are increasingly anxious to, to see that as a good thing, to see that as something that's necessary for the child's development. Yeah. There's, there's portions of the book, and I don't know if this relates to early childhood as much, and maybe you can help me make the connection, but you talk about, because we want to support children in expressing their desires, that you then have to realize that they're going to express themselves. So in an early childhood setting, when a child wants to express their own desires, and we know that this is good for them, how do we balance that? you know, there's, there's a structure for what we're doing or there's a, a given, you know, expectation. How do you support the child in expressing their desires, but also still gain a sense of, for lack of a better word, control? Well, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think, you know, as, as somebody who, who taught, I, I was trained in early childhood and I work with a lot of really good early and childhood. you're still afraid of early childhood and you were <laughs> no, I'm just afraid of managing a group. <laughs> I'm, I'm honest to God, when I, the one year I taught full time, I, I had like, I had these uh, four and five year olds in special education. And I also had a lot of kind of inner city kids. But my wife came to visit me, who's also an early childhood educator. She came to visit me and we were on the first floor of the building. So it wasn't that big a deal. But I was talking with a couple of kids and, it, and another kid was climbing out the window. I mean, that, that's... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I distracted you. It's it's managing the question, group. So, the question was about children expressing yeah, yeah. themselves. No, I, I think that, that well, I, I mentioned that because I mean, early childhood programs, ever since you know, I was trained you know, 40 some years ago, have always had free choice time. You know, that, that I, and I think that, that we recognize, here's what we all do, here's what we do as a group. We have circle time as a group. And this is something w w that everybody does. And, and if you want to contribute in a certain way, that's good. But also we have, we have free choice time. And I think that, um, that certainly one of the goals of early childhood programs are, are developing the sense of independence. And I think that, that as much as we can let kids do things for themselves, that's part of it. You know, where, where we said, do you want to do th this way or that way? I, want, I, I think it's really good for little kids to say, you're the expert on you. Because you, even with a three-year, I mean, when, when, uh, my, my wife, who's a wonderful Jewish mother, would, would, would tell my, 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 my son when he was little, you know, eat more. You know, I'd say, honey, let's, I'd say to him, Elliot, you know, you're the expert on, you're the one who knows when you're full and when you're hungry. And my, my, get, my sense is you should eat when you're, when you're hungry and stop when you're full. You know, you're the expert on you. And there's so many ways you can do that. With We fight with kids about you need to wear a coat. Well, most kids, by the time they're three or four, know what it feels like to be cold. And if they go out without a coat for a couple of minutes, they come back in as long as they don't feel coerced. And I think that there's a lot of ways that we can respect their individuality. We can give them choices during part of the day. And at the same time, we want them to be part of a community. And, and that, that it's not laissez-faire, it's authoritative. And, and we're in charge. Now, because we can't make a kid sit, sit and participate at, at, at circle time unless we hold them. You know, we, we, we want to not have that authoritarian kind of think that the idea was enforced. But I do think that, that we, we, with, even with pretty little kids, we can simply give choices. Do you want to do it this way or that way? As much as we can. We, we have free choice. And, and focusing on, it looks like you really like to do this, you know, like that. And other kids like to do something else. Right, and, and we work with educators, especially around a, an emergent style curriculum, which is not about 
um, such an authoritative decision of what's going to happen and what the children are going to explore, but to work off of their curiosities and to yeah. build out from there. But more specifically, we had talked about the decision-making process and that that needs to be flexed like a muscle. Yeah, and it, it, it turns out that um, my co-author and I think that this is part of the reason that so many kids, 30% of kids who go, to, go off to college don't make it past their freshman year. And so a lot of those kids are home by November of their, their freshman year. And we think it's, they just don't have enough experience running their own lives. And I think starting in early childhood, you know, where the, what the, the rule is don't do for a kid what he can do for himself you know, on, on a regular basis. You know, that it, it weakens them. And, um, and also, one of the really, that decision making, we want kids to practice making decisions and say, and learning from mistakes. You know, that, that, that's the way you, you, you develop the ability to make decisions. And also, that we used to think that the best decisions were, were made purely rationally. And it turns out, if you have emotional damage to the, if you have damage to the emotional centers in your brain, you can't decide what to have for breakfast. But, and so we want kids as they get older, particularly, paying attention to their own emotions and trying try to decide what, what do I want? What's best for me with our help? But I think practicing that and entrusting them to make decisions that are within their developmental capability really promotes that sense of autonomy and promotes respect for a kid. And also, as you said, it develops that muscle. My experience is when, you say, when I say to kids, you make this decision, they're ruthlessly honest with themselves. They, 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 they think they want help, they want to they want ask advice. So I think as, as, as much as we can, even certainly in, in early childhood, we're probably talking, by the time they're four or five, there's quite a few things that they can make decisions about. Yeah, and you flowed right into that follow-up question I had, which was about the moments of failure for children. Um, yeah. And what, so I think we know this, we know this intuitively, but why do you think it's so hard? You've witnessed a lot of conversations with parents. Why do you think it's so hard for them to allow their children or their students to fail? Yeah. You've heard lots of reasons why I can't. I can't let the, I have to help them make this decision because. Right, right. And I, I think that, um, I think m m most, most of the really experienced educators that I know say they've never seen anything like the, the level of anxiety in contemporary parents, you know, my, my, my daughter's uh, when my daughter's uh, kids started preschool, you know, they, they got a video every day about uh, uh, their kid, and it's sweet in many ways, but it kind of feeds into the idea that I, I couldn't go for two hours without worrying about my kid, and I, and I think that. Um, but that's the reality of today's parents. It it is, and I think that 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 that, that and that that we know that when when, when we're anxious. It's harder to promote autonomy in kids. And I think also that many parents have the idea that um, the kids will be damaged and they'll feel, they'll feel bad about themselves if, if they aren't successful. We want them always to be successful. Yeah. And I just don't think they know. If, if, they really, if they knew, they really got their head around the, the growth mindset. We want them to try hard things. Mm -hmm. This the way that the way that resilience and self-regulation develop is through controllable challenges, stressful things happening, making mistakes and learning from them. That's how the circuitry in the brain develops to be autonomous, to be independent, and to be well regulated. Um, I, I think that um, that that it would be easier. And certainly, I, I spent a lot of time lecturing to parents uh, about this kind of thing who've read my book. And so, some, of, some of the parents come, like, like uh, some, locally, we've had parents come four or five times to our lectures, I think, just to be reassured. They don't have to be so anxious. If the kid screws something up, that they can learn from it. But it's hard. It is uh, hard. Yeah, yeah. It is. And I think that that next step is having those conversations between teachers and parents. You talk in your book how parents can have conversations with the teachers to settle some of these things. What, you know, can you set us up for how teachers might be able to, I mean, you're saying that what I'm saying is teachers should have those opportunities with parents collectively and maybe just let the elephant in 
in the room get exposed about the, the stress parents feel about success of their children. Right, right. And I, I think that... Uh, right, so what, what, how would you suggest future... What, how, would, how should we approach the conversation with parents, I guess is what I'm asking. Yeah, and I, I think that... Um, that as a, I think as a teacher myself, when I, when I was teaching, um, that I, I, if, if parents were, were critical or, or they weren't happy with something, uh, that I, I would take it personally. And, it is, and for, in some, some cases, it was justified because I wasn't a very good teacher. Uh, but I think that oftentimes, especially with kind of hard to please parents, it really helps to remember that, that, there, that what's underlying this is huge anxiety. And, and one of the things that I found most useful in my own work is, is just the idea that people are always doing the best they can, including these highly anxious, hard to please parents. You know, they, they, they want to be good they're, they're parents. They're, they're just misguided. Mm-hmm. You know, they think their job is to, is, is to, their kid always needs to be successful. They always needs to be protected. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I find um, that the most often when parents are upset about something, that, that it's not about you as a teacher. It, it, it's, it's their anxiety. It's, you know, I think that so that what we tend to be, that, because what happens if, if, if teachers are critical of us, our amygdala senses threat and starts our own stress response. And then we get stressed and we get defensive. Right. But, but parents think, now, after listening to you, have a lot of ammunition and conversation start is that they can talk to parents and let them know that it's okay for children to fail and let them know you're there and you're doing it intentionally, not doing it intentionally, but providing them with the safe environment with which they can experiment and get to know themselves better. Right? Yeah, I, I, I do think that, that in terms of parent education uh, for early childhood, that, that's one of the most important things. I've done a lot of these podcasts since the book came out on early childhood and focus on how they, can, can kids can kids in early childhood, can five-year-olds start start. Uh, using knives or, or tools, you know, shop tools kind of stuff, that kind of thing. Because, um, because the, this idea that the most important thing is, is, is safety, you know, making sure that they never skin their knee kind of thing, that, 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 that doesn't help kids. And I think, so, that, I think that should be one of the major parts of parent education. Um, and I want, the teacher, I want teachers to know that many parents who, who, who love their kid, they want to be good parents, they can't stop worrying about them. Because they, when I used to do therapy, I used to ask really worried parents, what would, what would you be afraid would happen if you just stopped worrying for a little while about your kid? And they'd say, oh my God, I, I'd worry that I wouldn't be a good parent. I, I, I wouldn't be very compassionate or I wouldn't do, every, I wouldn't do everything I can to, to, to help him or protect him. And I think that this is recognizing, and it may, it may help your amygdala, your prefrontal cortex regulate just so that you don't get too stressed. We're working with parents um, that, that if, if they're if these, these demanding parents or if, if, um, that it's their anxiety. And we, we, we want to be assertive at certain points. And, but, but the main thing is we want to educate. Mm-hmm. This is our goal. Our goal is to have kids in a safe environment that provides these, these, these manageable challenges. That, are, that can be stressful for short periods in a very supportive environment because that develops the circuit of the brain for, for self-motivation and for self-regulation. Yeah, and, and you're making me think that there might be some journaling that teachers can start doing to see how well, that, see how well they're doing this and practice some of these things and see, feel their own presence and see if they can recognize stress in children and see how many times they're providing children with decision making. I feel like there's a little bit of a checklist there that they can sort of. I, I do too. And I think that this idea of, you know, if, if you come into school and you say to a group of, of three to five year olds and that, uh, that God, I was so frustrated last night, you know, I, I was trying to do something and, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm going to go home tonight and I'm, here's what I'm going to tell myself. I'm going to tell myself I can do it. You can do it, or, or yeah, I think I can. I think you know, and you just, right, right. just thinking out loud like that is, is one of the best ways I, I think to develop these skills in children or parents. If we teach kids, um, you know, th- th- some way of rating their feelings and whether a little feelings thermometer, you know, that, that, that here's you're really calm, here's where you're mad, here's a little worried, that we use the same thing. 
you know, he said, the last, here's, I, I felt kind of nervous coming in because there's so much traffic. And I was up here on, on, on this dress for mama. You know, just, just, we, can, we can have that same conversation and we can model the self-talk, the, the self-talk strategies. I, I, I use breathing. I use my belly breathing. Or when I was in the car, you know, I, 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 I did what we do in class where I, I breathe in through my, through my nose and I breathe out through my mouth. Like, we're, we're just modeled. We're using the same stuff. Right, to show the children. That's great. And that comes, you know, we're getting to the end of our conversation here. And if you know, you're still listening, I actually want to bring you in for our last question because we, we, we did this one together. Yael and I, um, we have a, a particular, hi Yael, we have a particular uh, thing that recurs in your book that we actually love. Oh and, yes. Yeah, it's this, um, it's this portion, I don't know if it's each chapter or just very often that it says what to do tonight. It's almost like you walk, I want to tell all the teachers here, it's a great book. Um, you walk through your story and your examples, you're a great storyteller, really appreciate that here today too. Um, you walk through these, but you don't leave us hanging. At the end, you say what you can do tonight. So in, in light of that, in our favorite part of the book, we want to ask you before we go and we open it up to questions, if you were to give us homework, and, and I can, maybe you kind of did allude to this already a little bit, um, what are some of the things you would want us to take away? What are the two or three, you know, what we should do tonight, um, ways we can practice this? Yeah. So, I mean, I, 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 I like that. I competitive, I know, but. No, no, I, I think and the, the, at, at the end of every chapter of our book, there, there, every chapter is what to do tonight. And, um, and there's a lot of practical stuff. And so one, I, I just kind of was looking through some of my favorites. And certainly this related to what we've been talking about. You know, that, that when kids are worried, if we have kind of anxious kids, let them know that, that, that they're safe, but don't reassure them excessively. You know, the, again, what the the message we want to give them is is you can handle this. And expressing confidence that kids can handle stressful stuff. Um, I, I think that um, certainly, I, I see I see a lot of anxious kids, and usually usually five, five and up, uh, not not so much two, three, four year olds, but but I see a lot of anxious kids, and it's counterintuitive to parents to think that. One of the ways they can help their anxious kids is to better manage their own anxiety because this idea is stress is contagious. So one of the most important, I think, uh, uh, what to do tonight is, is to focus on managing your own anxiety. And in our, in our, cha in our the chapter on a non-anxious presence, you know, we, we talk about various things that parents can do in terms of seeing a long view or spending, just focusing on enjoying your kid. And, I'll, and I'll, I will say for teachers, too, when I've, I've talked about this quite a bit, and teachers, for a lot, especially experienced teachers, just being reminded that one of the best things they can do for kids is simply enjoy being with them. Kids have that experience of being a joy-producing organism um, is, is a good thing. Get in flow with them, maybe. But, well, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah and, I, and I certainly, those, those are teachers who have kids at home, Spend an hour, spend an hour a, a week doing, ideally, with each one of your kids, doing something that's enjoyable. That, that's the way you get, stay connected. You develop that relatedness is one-on-one -on -one time. Okay, one more before questions. Okay, so I mean, in, in, the, in the, uh, one of the chapters, it's support autonomy, support autonomy, support autonomy, you know, and encouraging flow. And, you know, when I, when I see kids who are just, I'll see kids in grade school and they aren't interested in school that much. If they're really, if they're interested in sports or dance or music or art, I say, I don't worry about you because I know you're developing a brain that's going to know how, that's going to know how to, to, to be, to, to work on something high focus, high energy, high determination, low stress. Okay. And that's it's not like that. Great. Thank you. Oh, what a pleasure. What a pleasure. Thank you guys so much. We had a bunch of really interesting questions come in. I'm probably going to pick the top three okay. um, to, to um, address right now. All right. So one thing, and I think this will, I think this probably will appeal broadly to both teachers of really young children and par um, young parents at home or even grandparents. So somebody asked, where does toilet training fit into this autonomy model? It seems to be a trend now to do it quickly and early. 
like I think, you know, sometimes it's the same way as reading, right? Like we don't, you said about seven, but now the trend for toilet training in particular seems to be pushed really earlier. Do you think that something like that could be approached using a lot of the rules that you outlined? Well, I will say I'm, I'm not an expert on toilet training. I know that New York, particularly, <laughs> probably more than any place else, is this, this desire to get yeah. kids trained uh, early. And uh, I, I doubt uh, that um, that people who are trained earlier turned out to be better adults than people who are trained later. So it, it, it really, if, if we can train, I mean, I just, I haven't studied this. So I, I don't really know in terms of the research on, is it, is it helpful to kids to, to be trained earlier? Is it more stressful? To, I, I, I'm not sure anybody knows the effects of it. So I don't really have a strong opinion about it. I do okay. think that, that the idea for most things, the idea that if we can get certainly anything academic, the idea that if they get the, if they can start it earlier, they'll be better at it later is not true. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a really important concept. Um, yeah, you mentioned that about reading. Yeah, I did. And writing. Um, so somebody else asked, "What would you?" actually say to parents who are feeling so much anxiety about giving their children more freedom. And then a teacher gives an example. I spoke to a mom yesterday that told me she no longer even lets her 11 year old child ride her bike two houses away to visit a friend or walk to the bus stop by herself. Yeah. So I, I would suggest um, that the, the, the mom get therapy for anxiety. I mean, <laughs> really, I mean, for, for a teacher, it's hard because, um, because, you, you aren't, uh, te preschool teachers aren't mental health, experts in mental health. Uh, but certainly somebody who has that level of fear um, is just tr tr transmitting huge levels of stress and anxiety to their kid. And, um, you know, we have this perception that the, one of the things we, points that we make in our book, we have this perception that the world is much more dangerous for children than it used to be. And all the evidence suggests that it's not. That most of us really live in the safest time and place in human history. And so most of the anxiety that we have is exaggerated. And I think that, um, I think with, as teachers, if, we, if a parent says that, we can certainly say, for whatever it's worth, and I, and I, 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 pause, I, I preface a lot what I say to parents, for whatever it's worth. Mm -hmm. All this research suggests that, that letting kids take, take reasonable risks mm -hmm. is one of the best things we can do and expressing confidence they can manage and what I, what I suggest is you talk through the, the, talk through with your kid how to, how to stay safe. And then you just have to trust. You just have to trust that your kid's going to be able to manage the, the bike ride. And, but the more you constrict it and the more you give them the message that this, this is so dangerous, you have to stay at home at all times, uh, that you're, just, you're, much, you're much more likely to have a highly anxious kid. Yeah, great. And then um, the last question deals with um, children who are breaking rules. So um, if you've, I think this could apply both in the home or in the classroom, but if you've set out the clear concrete rules and you've kind of gone with that um, autocratic approach and you still have a kid who is repeatedly pushing the limits, maybe in an unsafe way, um, what are some strategies you would recommend in that instance? Well, I, I think that what we want is we want, we want kids to learn we want kids to learn how to be well regulated, how to make good decisions. And there are kids who they make they they, they break a rule, and you provide some kind of consequence, or they're they're timed out for a little bit, or they lose some privilege or something like that, and they learn from it. And it's just that a lot of kids that there's there's a uh, there's a guy who works with children who says the kids who learn the least from consequences get the most of them. <laughs> you know, and I think that what we want to do is we want to remember what we're trying to we're trying to to, to develop kids who um, are well regulated as opposed to kind of well controlled mm -hmm. and have self control. And so I think when kids when kids break rules, it's certainly okay for there to be consequences, and and, and sometimes it could be within our relationship. You know that that that. You may, because you made it so hard for me, I'm not sure I feel like reading to you right now, that kind of thing, and I'll read to you in, 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 to, tomorrow night. Or I, I, I'm okay with, with, if kids really break rules in a serious way, then you know, time them out for a little to think about it. But, but there are kids who get timed out all the time, and they just don't learn from it. The other thing is that as they get older, we can start this process we talk a lot about in our book called Collaborative Problem Solving. Where when you're, you don't want to talk about a kid, you don't want to lecture a kid about breaking rules 
when, when you're mad. But when you calm down, you bring it up again. And, and you say that, that he, let me t- I just want to tell you why we have this rule. It's, it's, it's for this reason. And, and, and I'll be really proud of you if, if you, the next time, if you make a different decision. Yeah, I think, right, that's great advice. Both detaching yourself and the child from whatever that heightened moment is can often make it a more fruitful conversation for both parties. Right, because what happens really is when a kid breaks a rule and, it start, and our stress response gets activated, then we, go, we can't do anything flexible. We can't do anything rational. We go into the same kind of lecturing or scolding or whatever we do, and, and kids ne- the kids never learn from, you know? And, and so I, I think the, the best rule certainly is not to tell kids we also we don't want to tell kids ten times. You know, I, I had I met with parents the other day who said it's, it referred to something as a constant battle. We don't want to battle about the same thing over and over again. It's just not worth it. We also want to ask that is it worth that when we think about this relatedness piece? I, I love the idea that this age old in, in parenting is, is we have we put our pro- child problems in three baskets. Basket A. It's stuff where it's worth prom- provoking a tantrum. You, 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 the kid, if the kid doesn't want a five-year-old or four-year-old doesn't want to hold your hand when you're crossing a busy street, you make them. You grab their hand and, 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 or you carry them because it's too dangerous not to. Mm-hmm. And basket C, it's just not worth fighting about and breaking some rules. And basket B is where it's important. But it doesn't have to. It can be a longer-term goal. It doesn't have. We don't have to. We don't have to enforce it. We don't have to set a consequence every single time. It may be something like brushing your teeth every single night. It's important. But if a kid misses a couple nights, it's not that big a deal. It's not. It's not worth going to the mat for. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, both Cherie and Dr. Strixrod. This was an excellent conversation. Hopefully, um, it proves helpful to the educators. Both were able to join us live today and those who will be who are watching this afterwards. Um, before we close, I just want to call your attention um, to a couple of upcoming things here at the Jewish Education Project. Um, on March 13th, um, together with PJ Library, we're going to be hosting a panel called Let's Talk About Race and Identity at Temple Emmanuel. Um, and continuing on this topic, um, our spring conference this year is the Resilient Child Strategies for Social Emotional Wellbeing. There will be an option for educators to attend in Westchester or on Long Island, um, March 26th and March 28th. And you can find information about both of those opportunities on our website, jewishedproject.org. Thank you again so much to Dr. Stixrud and to Cherie for being here and for sharing your insight. And, you know, Dr. Stixrud, I know this book has been really inspirational. We've read it here as a team, um, as a book club with our team and other teams here at the Jewish Education Project. And we've heard it's been great um, for directors to read with their staff. And some have even been doing it as a parent book club. So um, if you haven't read it yet, um, go out and, oh, Cherie has my copy, but go out and get your copy of The Self-Driven Child. Um, and, and thank you again. We know you're very busy. Thank you for taking uh, it's time. It's complete, a complete pleasure. Thank you so much. And, okay. And yeah, we have oh, some yeah. follow-up resources too, right? Oh, yes. Yes. Tomorrow, um, hopefully tomorrow or the next day, we will be sending a couple of follow-up resources um, as well as a link to a post-event survey. And if you need a certificate for professional development for participating in this webinar, there'll be instructions on how to access that as well. Thank you, Sherry. And, and we thank Dr. Dr. Stixrod for providing us with one of those articles. We yes. are curious to read along with you all of this great stuff. Yes. Great. Thank you. Wonderful. Great. Thank you so much, everybody. Awesome. Have a great afternoon. Okay. Bye-bye. Pleasure.